Hey, it's Kay and Matthew Hamilton. We have a big show. We have a big show. We're in New York. Listen, we have some <laughs> legends. We're not just a football show. No, no. Sean said we're an NBA show. We are a sports and entertainment vehicle out there. The one and only, the GOAT, the coolest guy in the world, and the nicest celebrity I've ever met in my entire life, Henry Winkler, is here ahead of HBO's Barry, which ends. The series finale is on Sunday. Maybe we can get the. You know, just get like little a little what happens. Well, what really? Talk, talk to me a little about Bill Hader action here. Plus, we have the fastest woman alive. Catherine Legg is joining us. She's racing in this weekend's Indy 500. She's vegan. What kind of milk does she want? We have lots of questions for her. A lot of questions. And then what, I got what I like question? an oat milk, personally. You would. What kind of question are you going to answer today with Hammer Time? Oh, we're going to look at Bijan Robinson and a way that I think Arthur Smith and the Falcons might use him. That's going to be really interesting and something we haven't really seen in the NFL before. Can so. the quarterback get him the ball? That's going to be a question. Ooh, Bijan Robinson, a star. Falcons, we'll see. Let's go. Henry Winkler is joining our show. I feel like he's listening to this. We saw him in the like Zoom yes. chat room. It made me a little nervous because <laughs> he's like the man. Yeah, he is. This is uh, maybe the interview that I am most excited for in the history of the show. I'm not for one reason alone. I was meant to connect him with Patrick Mahomes and make a dinner happen. And I talked to Big Game on the Kelly Clarkson show, and I don't believe they've had dinner. I don't believe they've talked, and we have to figure that out today. Yeah, it's kind of on you at this <laughs> point. usually is. Okay, OTA <laughs> started for 20 teams yesterday, a third, two-thirds of the league. And we got some um, eye candy, some visual love, courtesy of these squads. And we get a little morsel, a little peek at what's coming this fall. And we got to start with, just take it away. You love this Aaron Rodgers bit. You were like, get this in the show. <laughs> we got to start with Aaron Rodgers. Just look at the rollout here, the pump fake. Pumps pumps the camera. <laughs> it's very fun. Well, look at that. And then takes off for the touchdown. Mm. He's having fun. It's as if he's rejuvenated. It's as if he's embracing the East Coast and the big city market. It's as if yeah. those young players are bringing out the best of him. It's as if I said that a lot when this was going on. Okay, the yeah. Ravens. we got to move on to this. Okay, so Lamar wasn't there. Twitter's going nuts. It's not mandatory. When it's mandatory, he'll be out there. But we did get to see his weapons. Yeah. Zay Flowers. Isaiah Likely with a nice catch right there. Rashad Bateman is healthy. Healthy! There's a lot to be excited about in Baltimore, and yeah, Lamar not being there, I don't want it to take, yeah, put a damper on. I mean, look at that move from Zay Flowers. Can we just enjoy this, Ravens fans? You've been waiting for a receiver like Enjoy this. it. And most of the Chargers were in attendance. You'll notice Eckler is not in this video. We talked about Eckler yesterday. We we're talking about how bad the Chargers defense was last year and how they need to fix it and make it happen. But the breaking news happened this morning uh, regarding their running back. A new deal with his team. He'll be staying in LA this season. They added two million in incentives to his deal, securing uh, a piece that's really critical to the Chargers making that jump hopefully into contention in the AFC this year. Yeah, and that was something they really need to get done. If Eckler's not a part of that offense, it's hard to compete with teams like the Chiefs and the Bengals. So big, big news this morning that they were able to get that done. We'd love to see that. Which division should we tackle today? Your favorite one? Oh, yeah. I think we got to go AFC South. Anybody's ball game. All right, let's get to it. Hamilton, should you leave? Yeah, I think so. All right, fine. You get out of here. Uh, listen, I may not be in LA. That's right. We're in New York this morning. We're in New York really for the next, what, like three weeks? I'm here a lot. Uh, you're going to deal with a lot of Kay Adams here for a while. Okay. But we have Hamilton, and you can yell at me with these unanswered questions. You're, like, attached to this. Yeah. You can't get very far with that microphone on, but I like it. Uh, let's get to it. We're going to hit the AFC South. Uh, take a look at this right here. These are your FanDuel Sportsbook odds, okay? The Jags. Ha! Is this true? Did you make this up? I did not. The Jags are not only the heavy faves to win the South, they're getting the same odds the Chiefs are getting to win the AFC West at minus 160. The Titans plus 360, the Colts plus 550, and the Texans round things out at plus 800. Thoughts? It's, uh, it says a lot about the perception of Trevor Lawrence and this Jags team that they're, they're getting those kind of odds right now. Waffle House put him on the map. And let's start with those Jags. My question is, can they handle that? Don't think I'm crazy. Can they handle being the favorites? Yes, we believe in Trevor Lawrence. We believe in the pedigree. He's been there, done that, and Doug Peterson in that visor. But 
uh, I got some questions. Even though pretty much everybody's coming back and returning to Europe, especially with that core, and then you get Calvin Ridley. He gets to come into the mix for Trevor. This was our first look at him rocking that zero at Jags OTAs yesterday. Pretty good footwork. Oh, yeah, and I love the the zero. First year you can wear a zero. Yeah. I've seen it. I don't, that, that doesn't even pay, I don't pay attention to it, and you love it. That's why you put it in there. I even... <laughs> With all of this going for them, there are going to be people saying, Jags, who cares? Why? Because things like 2017 happen and then 2018, it kind of falls apart. That's why we think this. Is it sustainable? Can they build on this? This is a franchise that hasn't won back-to-back -back division titles since 1998-1999. Those are like Alanis Morissette, Counting Crows years. What are we talking about here, okay? They want to establish themselves in the public eye, in the public narrative as a contender. You got to follow up a great year with an even better year. It's just what you have to do or you're never going to get there. You're never going to get over the cliff and nobody's going to mention you in the AFC. And I'm not really looking at it like, oh, you won the division last year, so you can sneak up on you can't sneak up on anybody. I'm looking at it a little bit more pragmatically. When you win a division, you have to deal with the first place schedule. And in the AFC, that is what makes or breaks teams. Let me show you this. The Jacks played the Chiefs ugh, as their AFC West opponent, the Bills ugh, as their AFC East opponent, and the Niners. What? This is BS. The Niners are their crossover game. The rest of the division gets who? The Rams, the Seahawks, the Cardinals, and they also take take on the entire AFC North. It is going to be a tough path here, and it's going to show us what the Jags are made of. I do think they're up to the task here, and if there's anyone doubting whether or not Trevor Lawrence has turned a corner last season to this season, I'm just gonna leave you with this, guys. Second half of last year, Trevor went seven and two and was the highest rating passer in the entire NFL. The highest rated passer, 15 touchdown passes, two interceptions, and that was before he had a target of Ridley's caliber. So the road's not going to be easy. Duval up for the challenge, they've got momentum. Another year under his belt, another year of stability with the front office and Doug Peterson, and the sky is the limit in that division to waltz up to being a big dog and make an even bigger splash. And then I'm gonna have to do with you, you're gonna get like a tat another tattoo. You're gonna get a Jags tattoo. It's like the only thing you don't have. How do you know? Do you have a Jags tattoo? <laughs> oh, God. Stay tuned uh, to find is it out. the mascot and the thong? <laughs> On your lower back? <laughs> that's my question for the Jags. Get to the question. That, that's what it Get should to the be. The, the, the biggest question for the Jags is Hamilton having <laughs> whatever. Okay, next up, we're going to go to Nashville. My question there is can I get to Nashville at some point soon? Because I love it there. But can the O line overhaul the, can that whole situation help Tannehill and get the Titans' offense back on track? I don't think questioning Tannehill over and over again is entirely efficient or necessarily fair. He's proven he can win divisions and get the team to the AFC title game when he has support around him. But last year, they took his support away. They took food off of his plate, like the main course of his food and the weapon that is A.J. Brown. And they let the O-line completely fall apart and deteriorate. It's not a mystery why this offense was not good and why they struggled. He was pressured at the sixth highest rate of any quarterback. And even Derrick Henry, a total monster, even he was was only able to rush for 4.4 yards per carry behind that line, that line that ranked him 29th in the league. So Tennessee, they've revamped the O-line this season. They got four spots on that O-line projected to feature new guys. Okay, we got Eagles, former first rounder Andre Dillard. He's got tons of potential if he can stay healthy. They've got a Titans first round pick, Peter Skaronski, a, Pol a Polish guy, gotta love him. Uh, guard, left tackle, former Niners guard Daniel Brunskill as well. So when the Titans win, they win in the trenches. It might not be sexy, but Vrabel thinks it's sexy and a lot of people think Vrabel is sexy. So ipso facto, it's gonna look good if they can get it together. And we saw with this new front office regime with their GM um, can, you know, came together and they know what they are. They're a trench team and they put the emphasis back on building up the line. So whether it's Tannehill, whether it's Levis eventually who might get in there, whoever else you might want to throw in there, it's not going to work unless you, the investment works and those groups, that group, the offensive line uh, especially, is significantly improved. Not, not super sexy. It's not, who's, but... the, who's like the wideout that's going to pop on the scene? Traylon Burks, it's a, that's who they're counting on. First round pick last year after they made the AJ Brown trade. Arkansas and, boy. And he's a he's a physical he's a physical freak. Saw him have some moments, had some injuries last year, so that's who they're going to be counting on. I like it. How about the Colts? Let's go with them. The question is, what is the plan with Anthony Richardson? I was in this seat in New York talking to Chris Collinsworth, who said get him to sit for a couple of years, and I don't think that's the plan. <laughs> 
They take him to start. He looked incredible at the rookie premiere, by the way. So much hijinks, tomfoolery. Uh, there's going to be a ton of pressure on Shane Steichen, an awful lot of temptation to run him out there early. We love a Gardner Minshew around here. We do. But I don't know how long he can satisfy Colts fans who have been thirsty for a franchise quarterback since Andrew Luck and his surprise retirement into a cave somewhere where he's never to emerge. There's not one picture of him like at a 7-Eleven, a Piggly Wiggly, a Costco. Nobody, like if you see Andrew Luck, you know it's Andrew Luck. He can't exactly hide from people. He's just not seen by anyone. That's a really good point. He makes, he, he resurfaces every now and then. He, he crawls out of the woodwork. I hope but, they're patient. Yeah. I hope this team is patient, okay? Give Richardson what he deserves. He's got the potential. He's got the athleticism and the skills. Give him time to sit back, kick it, and develop. Don't make him ace the final in the first week. Let him read the, the rules of the game, okay? Let him figure it out, feel it out. We want him to be a superstar, and that's the best way how. The potential, the ability is there, but he's not gonna benefit if he's thrown in there right away. So few do. And beyond just the quarterback spot, there's a transition on this team, especially when it comes to the offensive line. Same sort of vibe with Tennessee. I'd be really hesitant to put him out there when you have seen in the NFL over and over again, but even recently, Chicago girl, Justin Fields, he's taken hit and hit and hit over the first couple of years. You hate to see it, and it does stop people developmentally. I'm not calling him Deshaun Kaiser, but like those kind of things, those bad situations, they live up here, they live all over here. It's not great. So um, we talked about Andrew Luck. Is Andrew Luck not the best example of this? What happened to him early on? All the extra hits he took behind a really bad offensive line that eventually led to him stepping away into said cave? Come on. Uh, and there's a new coaching staff, right? There's a, a marathon situation here, not a sprint for the Colts. Richardson's development is going to define this entire regime. They need to get it right. And I do think they have the coach to make the most of his skill set. We saw Steichen with Justin Herbert. We saw what he did with Jalen Hurts, who just got paid. Um, somebody was in the Super Bowl last year. But um, the patience is what I would say to make sure Richardson reaches the height of his abilities. And I will also say this, like, fans, don't make it hard on them. Don't make it hard on Ursay, who's going to read your tweets and then tweet something that's going to be a mess. Don't make it hard on Steichen, who give him a, a, a chance here as a head coach to, you know, give them the leash a little bit to make it happen, because that, that's sort of how this snowballs and you're involved. Okay, finally, the Texans. Do we have to? Okay, the Texans. <laughs> My question for the Texans is, can they be the sneaky last place team that gets into the playoffs. Okay, before you call me insane on the Twitter machine. Hey, idiots, they want to tweet about this. It happens every single year, okay? Some team no one is talking about ends up being much better than everyone thought that they would be. The Jags last year, the Bengals, I mean, <laughs> I knew they'd be good, but the Bengals before that. You got called crazy um, for saying that, too. A lot, really, really much so. Even, yeah. I'm not gonna say it. Ron Rivera, his commanders, when he took over in 2020, I'm just wondering, do the Texans have the same sort of energy and ingredients? Ingredient one, some exciting young players returning from last year, and they have one of the best left tackles in the game in Laramie Tunsil with the best character arc, one of them in the NFL, a star running back in Damon Pierce. Um, young secondary. They were top 10 last year, and now they have 2022 draft picks, Derek Stingley Jr. and Jalen Petrie, okay? A emerging talent at receiver, Nico Collins. You like him? Yeah, I do. Big he made fan? some big plays last year. He, he also missed some him. time with injuries, but he made some big plays for them. All right, then, you know, they've got the, court, the comeback of John Mechie. Yeah. Got a good list here, okay? He probably would have been a first-rounder if he wasn't dealing with some of the adversity that he'd been facing. Nick Casario... Never is outright or loud. It's always shh. It's always wheeling and dealing quietly. Let's everybody else talks about it, talk about it. And he sort of silently let everything last year crush it during the draft and brought in and built some great pieces around. So then there's big time off season ads here. The Texans added franchise cornerstones in CJ Stroud, Will Anderson Jr. They snagged top safety Jimmy Ward away from the Niners, Sheldon Rankins away from the Jets to fix that run defense. Hamilton, you're nodding. Yeah, I love, Rankins, is, a lot of these are really under the radar, obviously the two top draft picks, but a lot of these are really under the radar pickups that just make that roster so much more complete. Shaq Mason, they got what they traded with Tampa. He's gonna help the offensive line. Uh, so CJ is probably pretty happy. 
Yeah, I'm, nobody's talking about me. It's the best situation. Influx of talent, nobody expects anything from me. Ingredient number three, D'Amico Ryan's, to bring it all together and whip up something beautiful down there. For the first time in a long time, there's positive momentum building here. And it may not be 2023 in, in which this comes together, but I wouldn't put it past them, and I would not be shocked, especially like second half of the year, if it's the, you know, the Jags and the Texans, or the Jags and the Titans having a hard time putting them to bed in that division. I'm just saying. And if you look at FanDuel Sportsbook and you like stuff like that, they have the second longest odds to make the playoffs right now. Pretty good value, Happy. Yeah, yeah, plus 520. The Cardinals, oof. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I'm with you. They've done a lot of really under the radar, really good things this offseason. I think Casario is doing an incredible job, and yeah. this thing's moving in the right direction. Because Sarah's probably pretty mad that we're talking about it. He doesn't like when people do that, yeah. but that's okay. We are believing in the Texans. Let us know what you guys think. Up next, we have an absolute legend on the show. Will he be whining and dining with ricotta and chicken and whatever he was going to make for the greatest football player right now? Patrick Wilms, Henry Winkler is next! Listen, we've had tons of guests, celebrities, Hall of Famers, actors, musicians, rappers, but my next guest is my favorite guest, an Emmy Award-winning actor starring as I'm Gene Cousineau on the hit series Barry, which I cannot believe ends this Sunday. The finale is at 10 p.m. Eastern on HBO. And with a statue in Milwaukee, we welcome Henry Winkler. How are you? <laughs> I'm so How's great. Everything? We love having you. And I enjoy Everyone being Everyone is excited. Here. <laughs> Thank you. Listen, Henry, that photo, our producer who produced this interview and learned so much about you, more than he ever thought he would over the past couple days here, that is his dog. I know you love animals. That's his dog. His dog is named Fonz in front of the Fonz statue in Milwaukee. I have to say that is one of my favorite photographs. I get photographs from people all over the world, and the Fonz on the Fonz is the greatest. You love a Fonz on the Fonz, eh? Uh, how would it, what, what does it mean to you, Henry, that after 50 years, 50 unbelievably successful, impactful years in this business, that your legacy continues to touch so many people's lives that on my 5 a.m. call this morning, every single producer, writer, person in front and in back of the camera said, oh my gosh, you're having Henry Winkler on. Uh, you know what, it is, uh, it is hard to put into words uh, truly, I, I've said this before, I had a dream. I'm lying in my bed on the west side of New York, and now I'm sitting here with you, um, and I have lived this, in, in so far, this incredible, incredible dream. And part of that dream is Barry, which is crushed it on HBO. Listen, when I started watching the first season, I was like, this is kind of cute. I like it. And then it, it, it's had its ups and downs. It is very compelling television. Congrats on the success of this run. And you can just tell us all how it's going to end. Well, you know what? That would be my pleasure, except I would be dead. <laughs> uh, they would absolutely kill me. But here's the thing. You know, uh, if it ain't on the page... It ain't on the stage. And the writers of our show, mm. uh, Bill Hader and Alec Berg, the co-creators of our show, the vision of our show, have been so incredible to be part of, I must say. I, I, am, I am grateful beyond. And, of course, there's a case to be made for them getting a deal done finally, and I'm sure that'll go over very well and hoping to help them secure that with all those uh, brilliant writers uh, trying to get what they want uh, with what's going on in Hollywood. We're here in New York. We're excited. Go ahead. Go ahead, Henry. No, no. I was just going to say I was going to break some news that uh, I have finally, uh, after a long negotiation, uh, I have been drafted by the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, I will be on their team this year. It's amazing. I'm going to suit up Oh, 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 my God, I can't believe it. Henry, how did this happen? In what position? Okay, I'm going to stand right next to Kelsey, and then I'm going to stand behind Kelsey, and he will protect me for the season. Uh, and I will just run with the ball, and uh, he will be like a wrecking machine um, and knocking over the pins of any other team. 
Okay, this is an excellent plan. He's going to play fullback for Henry Winkler to make, score 20 touchdowns this year and break some records, which we would love to see. What kind of qualities do you have? What kind of a football player will you be? Are you shifty, elusive? Are you uh, put your head down yeah, and I'm, run I'm with the ball kind of that. guy? Yes, yeah, it will be very, <laughs> very difficult to find me on the field. Um, but, you know, uh, if I catch one ball from the master Mahomes, I will be uh, in, in, in heaven. Then everything I've ever dreamed of will have come true. Now, Henry, you and I saw each other on the Kelly Clarkson show. We're going to get into your Chiefs talk. We t uh, talk here, but we Did talked about this goal Mrs. you Mahomes? have. Well, get, listen, first we got to show everybody. We made a video for Mrs. Mahomes with Kelly Clarkson. Take a look, everybody. Do Kelly it. Clarkson What's wants up, to really? come. What's, yeah, I was like, can I get invited? Yes. I want to come. I, I want to come. Melissa I mean, wants I'll, to come. I'll, I'll, yes. Yeah. Yes. yes, and I Winkler. Room. I have room. Henry's like, everyone's coming to my house. And we have ketchup. <laughs> ketchup. We have, we have so much ketchup. We love ketchup. <laughs> now, listen, Henry, I saw them in Kentucky, the night before the Kentucky Derby. I talked to them for one second. There we are. They were on their way to Miami to go to the Grand Prix, the F1 race. They've been so busy. We have to make this happen. Have you talked to them about it? I have not talked to them. I only send them vibrations. Uh, you know, uh, okay. I, I, I invited uh, the Mahomes to my house for chicken stuffed with ricotta and spinach with a reduction sauce. Uh, I have yet to hear from them, but Patrick did invite me to the field. He gave me his jersey. He signed it. I can't ask for more. Where do you have that? Where do you keep uh, that? I have it upstairs. Uh, it is protected. Uh, it is in uh, <laughs> first tin foil, uh, cellophane, uh, and then a, an old shopping bag. Okay, well, that is, Henry, well done by you keeping that protective and airtight. Uh, you are you are sort of famous at having dinners at your house. I've heard you've had Kim Kardashian at your house. You've had all sorts right. of these incredible parties, right? Well, Kim Kardashian is a friend of my daughter's. And so she has been at our house since high school with her wonderful sister, Courtney. Um, but, mm. you know, it is a lot of fun to sit around the table with a very disparate collection of, of human beings and uh, just laugh and, and have interesting conversations. Now, the thing about vibrations is you can manifest things and sort of make them happen. So let's keep that, that theme. And you, yeah, you like hosting people. I want the reduction sauce. That was a very specific detail. Let's, let's really create this dinner party for Patrick Mahomes and for Brittany Mahomes and maybe for your new fullback, Travis Kelsey, who's uh, a Hall of Famer to be in the National I Football have. League. I have. Can I just say, uh, um, Mr. Kelsey wore a T-shirt when I went onto the field, and it said uh, Fonzie, uh, Fonzie Family, uh, the Chiefs. And I have uh, that T-shirt and a sweatshirt. So uh, Mikel, uh, uh, Kelsey and his mom, his brother, uh, anybody else he wants Donna. is also welcome at the same time. Okay, I love this. Everybody loves you in Hollywood. Everyone loves you on the Chiefs. We're going to make a guest list of celebrities because everyone has to play a role for the perfect dinner party. So I'm going to say, okay. of all the celebrities you've worked with, and Henry, you have literally worked with everyone, and everyone loves you the most of anyone that's ever existed, 50 years in this business, which celebrity at the dinner party is manning the grill? Oh, the, the, the celebrity manning the grill. Um, uh, you know what? A Bill Hader... I think he's very shy, uh, and he would be great uh, uh, to um, to make everything uh, that we're going to eat and uh, then come and sit down. Okay, I love that. Who's in charge uh, of the music for the night? Who is it? Oh, Harry Styles. Uh, but then, you know, uh, Brandy, uh, Brandy Carlisle is at the table. <gasps> I would just, if Brandy Carlisle would just sing one line of something, I think every, I would just die at that dinner. That would be amazing. She's the most beautiful voice of all time. My favorite oh my voice. Gosh. You know what I think? I think she is the, the, the female version of Bruce Springsteen. I, I saw her in concert last summer. She is nonstop. She is a walking musicale. 
uh, yeah. and uh, you know, it would just be if if uh, Louis Cabaldi was not so shy, uh, I would <laughs> have him. Uh, I would have him over just to say hi. He wouldn't have to partake in the conversation because he is so internal. And so internal. And so Harry Styles can do the music. Brandi Carlisle's a rock star. She might do some performing. She might get the dance party starting. Who's pouring the drinks? Which celebrity would you pick as the sommelier of the evening? Who is pouring the drinks? Well, I think that we would have to be in moderation because we don't know if people are driving or if they are Ubering. So I would say a Barack Obama uh, would be in control of the alcohol. Uh, you know, I don't I think he would give everybody just the right amount. That's a beautifully well said answer. I love that. All right. Last one here. Who's showing up late? Who is showing up late? Wow, that one it it, it I um who Adam is Sandler. Sh- Adam Sandler and in shorts. In shorts and in shorts, and that's what we love about him. We have to have those crazy outfits. Uh, you know, you also you're talking about music. You've been in these incredible appearances. We saw some random cameos. You were in MC Hammer's music video for Too Legit to Quit, which is incredible. Uh, and your l- last music video appearance was in Sia's Santa's Coming for Us. So who is next on the Henry Winkler appearance music video cameo bucket list? Well, you know what? I I, um, I would have to say um, uh, Brandy or uh, Bruce, uh, if I come back, if there is such a thing as reincarnation, <laughs> I'm coming back as Bruce. But Sia, now, <laughs> I die for Sia. You know, I love people who need to sing. The, the singing is an extension of their emotionality, not just, oh, it's a nice voice. Sia, I have tweeted her, talked about her, and then I got a call would you be in her Christmas video? And I went, of course I will be. Oh my God, I'm going to get to meet Sia. The (laughs) only person who doesn't show up for that particular video is Sia. (gasps) Okay, she's got to come to the Patrick Mahomes dinner. She's got to be there. Her and Brandi Carlisle can do a little something. Absolutely. Whatever she (laughs) wants to eat. You know, I always ask every guest, do you have uh, uh, major allergies or major dislikes uh, so that we would craft the uh, the menu around each person who came. It sounds perfect, and I'm sure the second Patrick Mahomes can get over there, he will absolutely do that. Now, you've been busy, not only just being in music videos and working on Barry, which again, the series finale, sadly, but will be very compelling to watch, will be 10 p.m. Oh. Eastern, Sunday night on HBO. I have to tell you, I'm in the show and I cannot wait. <gasps> Because, you know, I am only in uh, a pod. Uh, There's Sarah and Stephen Root and and, uh, Anthony uh, Corrigan. They're all in different parts of the show. I never get to see. So I'm seeing it with the audience. I cannot wait to see what happens. I just can't believe you survived to the last episode as their character. So we're very excited to see that. And we're excited to see what happens. Uh, You have all these books behind you. I remember interviewing you once, Henry, for People magazine. And we talked about this brilliant collection, some of your books. I think you read me a little of Alien Superstar. And you have Hank Zibzer, which is great. It's an incredible series. And it uh, all sort of ties into dyslexia, which is very near and dear to your heart. And you do such amazing work in that space with awareness and education. But you also have another, a new book, back there since last time I talked to you. It's Being Henry, Um, The Fonz, and Beyond. Yes, this comes out uh, on the day after my birthday. It is, I I have to say, it is so scary because you, you write the story of your life. What I realized is that it really is the journey from being who I thought I should be to becoming more authentic today, right now, uh, and I I didn't even realize it as we were writing it together. I worked with this wonderful man, Jim Kaplan, uh, who helped Mm -hmm. me mold my life. And uh, what happens if people are bored? 
Mm, I think it's a, an incredible book and uh, that we can all pre-order right now. And it's coming out the day after your birthday. So happy early birthday to you. It's Thank Being you. Henry the Fonz and Beyond. So you can get that wherever books are sold. And I would urge you not just to get this, of course, but to get um, one of the 39 books that I believe that you've authored and been a part of, which is absolutely incredible. Uh, we wish you so much luck and happiness. And you're one of the kindest people I've ever come across in my entire life. So uh, we are rooting for you in the series finale. Hopefully it ends well for Thank Gene uh, over on Barry on HBO. We appreciate you. I just Thank want you. to say, first of all, what a lovely time to be with you again. And uh, secondly, if the Mahomes want to come and watch the final episode with me in my living room, they are, oh, it's welcome, welcome. How to make this happen. We have to make this happen. Henry Winkler, everybody. Uh, new, sorry, new Kansas City Chief uh, versatile weapon. Offensive, offensive yes. weapon for the yes. for Andy Reid. Secret <laughs> weapon. Henry Winkler. Yeah, secret, secret weapon who needs another job. Now, after this, I don't know if Henry wants to race in the Indy 500, but we have, there's one female driver out of 33. Catherine Legg joins us after this right here on Up and Adams. We'll be right back. Very excited about our guest who's got a big weekend ahead. She has driven all over the world in every type of race. I'm talking sports cars, stock cars, indie style cars. I mean, if it's got wheels, she can drive it. This weekend, she'll be competing in the, I can't believe this, the 107th Indianapolis 500. Catherine Legg, welcome to Up and Adams. How are you? Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for having me on. I'm okay. Listen, I'm asking you how you are because let's just get right to it. I could not believe this when I saw it. There was a collision. This happened yesterday at practice. The Indy 500 is days away. Talk me through what happened. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, racing is dangerous. Thankfully, I'm okay and, and Stefan will be, will be okay. Um, never want to see things like that happen, but um yeah, onwards and upwards and, and looking forward to, to the race this weekend. So I'm, I don't know as much about racing, so I was hoping you could tell me when something like that happens, of course, it's part of the sport, like you're saying, you don't want it to happen, but uh, it's something that you, you have to deal with. What happens? What's the process when you're saying, let's look up and beyond now to getting to the race with you personally and with the car even? Like, what's the process from now till race day? Yeah, so... The car is obviously destroyed and I have an awesome team behind me that will repair it, uh, rebuild it and get it ready for race day. Um, you know, you have to analyze what happened, what went wrong. You, you have to be grateful that you have um, such an amazing group of guys that are, are willing to go and rebuild everything and work really hard all week to, to get it back on track. And, um, you know, we will race with Stefan um, this weekend. Um, he'll be with me, I hope, and um, I'll definitely be racing for him. And, yeah, you just you just put it, put it to the side and um, you learn from it, you move on, and you have a healthy respect for the dangers involved, but you don't dwell on it. I think it's really only the people outside of the sport that, um, that kind of, that don't understand, okay, it's a big wreck, but they happen and you have to be able to, um, work through it and just move on. I think it's really beautifully said. And I think you're, you know, you're saying outside of the racing world, but what you're saying in your space sort of resonates for anybody in any walk of life when something happens and they have to sort of pick up the pieces and move on. That really resonates with me. Uh, but, you know, this is a really special race. I know it's your third Indy 500 and for the first time in 10 years, what brings you back to Indy for this race? And, you know, it's the crown jewel of the IRL. What separates it from the other races that you have competed in? Uh, so Indy 500 is the biggest race in the world, right? It's um, it's the race that everybody wants to win. It's the one where you go down in history if you do win. Um, it's just, it's it's in your skin. It has a an energy of its own. It has a, a personality of its own. It has its own vibe. It's so difficult to describe. If you've been there, either working there, driving there, or as a fan, You'll understand it, but you really have to go and experience it. Um, just the energy from 300,000 people is amazing. The challenge that it takes to do an average of over 230 miles an hour for 500 miles is no mean feat. I mean, think about it. We are crossing a football, a football field a second, right? Yes. So 
it's 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 quite it's quite insane really <laughs> when you think about it uh yeah that sounds pretty insane and you just made history i know it was the fastest single qualifying lap and four lap qualifying average by a female driver in 107 years that's how long and how often people have been you know racing in the the indy 500 the biggest one and you were recorded at what you said 231 miles an hour i'll never do it i'll never have the chance to do it i can go and watch and get that concept i just want to ask you to sort of walk me through what it's like going through an entire race and how hard these full races are on the body what it even takes to train for something like this well it's not like you wake up one day and you decide that you're going to be an IndyCar driver and you're going to go and compete in the Indy 500 I think that's an important uh, point to make you have a uh, years of training in the lower formula it's like going to school right you start off um, in a lower grade and you kind of work your way up until you are qualified for the big leagues and so I started off in a, li a little smaller car and uh, worked my way up through the ranks and it's it's not like I haven't been driving for the past 10 years. I've been racing sports cars, uh, predominantly sports cars, mm -hmm. although I've been racing a bit of everything, as you mentioned. So I've still got the reflexes. I've still been training. Um, it obviously is very hard on the body. I mean, you can't you can't really describe it to somebody who's never done it, but it beats you up physically. The, uh, the oval races, like the Indy 500, they are not quite so hard on your body because it's not bumpy. Um, and you don't have too much braking to do. So the force isn't that much, but the keeping mentally in the game for three hours or whatever it will be, depending on how much yellow flag periods there are, safety car periods, um, you know, it, it, takes, it takes it out of you, but we're trained for it. We train every day for it. We've trained on track for it. So we're ready. How do you train mentally, Catherine, for that? Again, I think it's a period of like doing it over a number of years. We all started racing go-karts, so we were all trained for competition. Um, mm. And I think then you compete in smaller races of 20 minutes or less, and then you figure that out, and then you just move on and you figure that out. And you learn yourself, right? As you progress through and you grow up, because we all pretty much started doing this when we were kids, um, you learn what it takes for yourself and like what you need and how you talk to yourself and uh, and how you know self talk is so important and who you surround yourself with and and that kind of thing. So it's a process, but it's not. Again, I think people look at it from a, what would I need to do if I was going to go and do the Indy 500? But that's so unrealistic. It's it's second nature to us, and we don't actually think about it. I get offered, I get asked often, I should say, um, like. What are my rituals and what do I do? And it's become such a habit and so subconscious that I don't even think mm. about what they are, are anymore. So it's difficult to even describe. You know, it's a job. At the end of the day, I love it. And it's the best job in the world. Like, what do you want to do when you grow up? I want to be a race car driver. Um, it's the best job, but it is a job. And so we're focused, blinkered on. And we just work yeah. through all the tools that we have in the car and all the things that we have to do with the engineers. So it's just doing it step by step. You mentioned it being a process, it being a routine. You also mentioned like tons of kids with go-karts when we were little, but not everybody decides to turn into this professionally. What was the moment that you said, yeah, this is what, how I'm going to earn a living. This is how, what I want to do on a professional level. What was that, like paint the, the scene in a movie when that happened? I, I wish there was. I wish it was like this big romantic moment, but there really wasn't. <laughs> uh, um, I think I, I never realized that I could, do it I think because there were no women racing in England uh, you can tell I'm from England back then when I was kind of growing up doing go-karts there there wasn't anybody doing it so I didn't really have a female role model uh, in racing I had a lady that sailed around the world single-handedly that I had as a bit of a hero growing up but there wasn't any women there really wasn't any women in racing at all at that time you know over here there was um Janet Guthrie, Lynn St. James, and then latterly Sarah Fisher and Danica. So you had some over here, but back home there really wasn't, there really wasn't anybody. So I just kept trying and I just loved it so much and I don't have an ounce of quit in me. So I just kept on keeping on. And I guess that tenacity got me to my dream. And uh, that's what I've continued to do for the last 18 years. 
and congratulations on all the success and we wish you so much luck. You said when you were growing up and wanting to do it, there wasn't an example or women doing it, but from all my research that I did over the past couple of days, there still aren't very many women that are involved in these bigger races. You're the only woman, in fact, in a field of, I think, 33 total drivers this weekend. You're only the ninth woman to ever race in the Indy 500, so I wanted to recognize that as it is special and it is trailblazing, and you are that hero and that example for other people. And I know that you advocate for women being involved in motorsports. What needs to happen so that more women can be brought into the fold? That's a good question. Um, I think there needs to be more up and coming in lower formula, like I said earlier, to kind of work their way through the ranks. Um, hopefully one day we get to nine women actually in the race, just not having done the Indy 500 over the last 107 years. But times are changing. And actually in the 10 year hiatus that I've had, um, I've noticed that there are way more women fans. Um, I actually have a cosmetics company that I partnered with, Elf Cosmetics, this year. First cosmetics company ever to uh, wow. to be involved in IndyCar racing. And that just shows that now, you know, you can, you have a female audience. You have uh, female fans. You have women that are interested in the sport. And so that will in turn snowball and get more young girls interested in it. And then they'll start go-karting and they'll make their way up through the ranks and, and hopefully one day be the Catherines of the future. Catherine, I also have a deal with Elf, and I'm a football girl. I work in a very male-dominated industry, as you know, and I, I think know. they're so ahead of the ball, and they're really into empowering and reinforcing the things you're talking about, so that's very, very cool. And you have a new fan in me, and I'll be uh, cheering you on in your racing career as you drink some sort of vegan milk when you cross yeah. the finish line <laughs> at the Indy 500, which I'm very, very excited about. You, I feel like, uh, before I let you go, there's, you know, I feel like just through this interview and getting to know you through these handful of questions there's a lot of misconceptions about racing about what it takes about what it is and it's very sort of insular what's one misconception that you really want people to know about or what's one thing about the racing world that you think is really important to highlight for people who are watching my show who love the nba and the nfl oh my gosh that's such a great question I think everybody thinks that being a race car driver is just like driving a normal car only a bit faster and, and they're all like, I can drive, I drive to work or I do this, I drive to the supermarket. Well, it's really, it's really nothing like that. Everybody says, do you have a bunch of speeding tickets? No, because it's so totally different and so far removed. I think, I think um, if you imagined throwing a washing machine down a tunnel at 230 miles an hour and getting beaten up in the process, that's more like what being a race car driver is like. Wow, that is a perfect way to put it, and I'm so glad. And stop asking your questions about speeding tickets, everybody. We wish you so <laughs> much success. Please, everybody, tune in and watch Catherine kick ass at the 107th Indy 500. It's on NBC Sunday night at 12.30 Eastern. I know you've been through some adversity this week. Get some rest, and we'll see you on Sunday. Catherine Leg, everybody, let's go! We'll be back right here on Up and B. John Robinson lining up at receiver during Falcons minicamp. Say what? Everyone's excited to see what these Atlanta Falcons do with him. Matthew Hamilton here for another edition of music? Yeah. Time to time. Where's Winkler? Da -da -da. <laughs> Winkler's people said no, I think. We couldn't get him to record that. I asked the question, is Arthur Smith a mad genius? Taking a running back eighth overall in 2023. That's a pretty bold move. Yeah. Especially when you have two guys in the backfield that already had a thousand plus yard teams. What do we got? Yeah, so you saw us. in that video right there, the route running skill, the pass catching ability from Bijan. But I think there's another element to all of this too. That's like a triple sow cow. Yeah. Well, Arthur air. Smith, we've seen over the years, he loves hybrid players. Cordero Patterson being the most famous example. He moved from wide receiver to running back in 2021. But there was another guy that he had last year Avery Williams that he used at running back. He was a cornerback in Deep college. Pull. And I think this gives a little window, the way they used him into the unique way that the Falcons might deploy Bijan this season beyond just as a tailback and pass catcher. There's Avery at, at wing back right there. Cordero Patterson in the backfield at tailback. You're gonna see Williams come in motion here for a jet sweep. 
They'll fake back to Patterson the other way. They leave the end unblocked, okay. knowing that Williams can outrun that angle. And what that does, it gives you two tight ends out in front to lead block. Extra blockers out in front by leaving the unblocked man. You see Williams turn the corner, pick up a big gain. I think we're gonna see a bunch of this out of Bijan when he lines up in that slot receiver position. And then you'll see what else that does for you here. Same exact formation, Williams at wing back, Cordero at tailback in the backfield. This time, they're, the jet motion comes again, but they're not giving it to Williams. But look at what that action does. It forces the defense to have to widen. They leave the end unblocked again. And look at the lane that's created for Cordero. He's able to explode for a 40 yard gain on so that play. Fun. And when you can have multiple running backs on the field, and create all this misdirection, all the stuff you have to worry about, Bijan as a pass catcher, and on those jet sweeps, it creates a lot of confusion for the defense. After seeing this tape, and I have not thought about Avery <laughs> ever, <laughs> uh, it's almost like we should have seen this coming. So you and I kept saying Bijan to the Eagles, but mm -hmm. we, they've, they've had multiple halfbacks a lot, right? Yeah. They've yeah. done this, it's as if we were not really, I'm seriously though. Yeah, no, it's true. There, there, were, there, there were signs there. They ran, guys, on 55.3% of plays, the second highest clip in the league behind the Bears. And they did, you know, have really, really more than any other team, multiple halfbacks on the field at the same time. What else you got? Yeah, and there's also the other more obvious component here to him lining up at receiver, which is him running routes and catching the ball. Let's take a look. So I wanted to take a look at what that might look Ooh, at too. Oh, fun! So look at this. This is from last year. The Falcons have two running backs on the field right now. Tyler Algier up top, Avery Williams in the We're slot. An and they're Williams in an, show. They're in an empty backfield okay. with two running backs on the field. So here it's a third and long. You see the three Falcons to the bottom, three Bucks defenders over them. They're just going to run a screen to Williams. And you'll see as he catches this, safety Mike Edwards is 20 yards off the ball. They have two blockers out in front. So you create that much space. Avery Williams is able to get them close to the first down, but you get the ball in that type of situation to a generational type of talent in Bijan. You, you might be able to that. house some of those. You I believe really he is do. that. I really do. Where so, am I drafting him in fantasy? He's a first round pick. Absolutely. Offensive rookie of the year. I think so. Let's take a look at the odds, guys. Offensive rookie of the year is here. Because it all works out. I mean, first of all, the value of the running back is going to rise. But he's the favorite at plus 300. Yeah, and if you put him in these positions like we saw, those plays that we saw for Avery Williams start to become Bijan's plays, we're going to see something really special and something that we haven't really seen at the NFL level before. Oh, I'm taking JSN all the way. <laughs> Are you joking? JSN to the house for that value. We'll be back. Great hammer time. <gasps> Did you hear about Henry Winkler? I'll I tell did. you in the break. I'll tell you in the break. We'll be back. Great one. Hey, what'd you learn today? Um, I learned a lot about Henry Winkler and his mental approach to dinner parties. I'm still thinking about the laundry machine down a tunnel at 231 miles per hour. Go Catherine Legg.